Would you turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Galatians chapter 3? I want to invite you this morning as we open God's word together to allow God to prepare our hearts to come to his table because communion is set before us this morning and we have this privilege and this invitation to come and gather around his table this morning. But we're told to examine ourselves and so we need God's word to help us to do that. Galatians chapter three and verse one. Just one verse this morning that we're gonna look at. Paul writes, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The word of the Lord. The title of my message this morning is Graphic Content. Normally, when you're going to portray or post graphic content, it comes with a warning. Warning. Graphic content. User or viewer discretion advised. When you study the life and the ministry of Paul, Paul was committed to portraying a certain graphic image over and over to his hearers. And Paul would say, no discretion is advised. I want everyone to see the image and hear the message of Christ crucified. So much so that in his letter to the Corinthians, second, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul writes that he decided that he wanted to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. So central was the message of the cross to Paul that he says even at one point, I didn't come to baptize, I didn't come to do any other thing but to proclaim this single and portray this single graphic image of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now we know as Christians, and it's probably obvious to us that this is the very heart, this is the very center of what we believe, the cross, and what God accomplished for us there. And yet I heard someone say recently that when we fail to state the obvious, it results in those things to remain obvious. And so this morning, what I want to do is just, again, portray the image of the cross for us to consider. Because if you're anything like me, you spent a lot of time in church, you, you've grown up in church, perhaps you've heard mentioned the cross of Jesus over and over and over again in a phrase, in a sentence, passing by. We talk about the cross all of the time. But if we fail to speak of the obvious things concerning the cross, then those things will no longer remain obvious to us. And it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. In fact, in Scripture, there were certain things that God wanted his people to remember that he had done for them. And he would set up memorials and say, each time that you see these things, I want you to remember what I've done in delivering you and in acting on your behalf. And yet, within the course of one generation, those things would be forgotten. Because what was obvious to one generation because it was failed to be mentioned again and again and to be remembered, it failed to remain obvious to the next. And so this morning, 
I want to talk about what Paul is writing about the cross. Jesus Christ crucified. Paul says in this verse in Galatians 3 that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified to the Galatians. Now, what does that mean? Because they're way up in the north, way far away from Jerusalem. This is years past the actual event that took place outside the walls of the city when Jesus was hung up on a cross at the place of the skull called Golgotha. So what what does Paul mean when he writes this? What, What he's describing is, number one, that his message was public. It was the same word that you'd use to describe the posting of a public announcement, a written announcement across the city. We might think of it in our day like a billboard, something very visible, something very public for everyone who passes by to see. This was the message of the cross for Paul. It wasn't something hidden. It wasn't secret. It wasn't something only to be heard by the initiated. Paul was saying, this was the message I posted all over town for everyone to hear and to see. This message of Christ crucified. But there's something more in this phrase when Paul says to the Galatians, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, he, he's speaking about a graphic description, something that would have undoubtedly have left an impression on the hearers because the description was so vivid. And apparently, that was Paul's ministry and method, was to go to a place where people had never heard of the name of Jesus and so vividly describe his suffering and his work upon the cross for them that the impression of it would lead them to trust in God and to give their lives to him in faith. And so today we gather around the table to remember these very same things. And today I want again for Christ to be publicly portrayed as crucified in our hearing and in our sight. So I have eight words that I want to just mention and briefly describe as we remember today what Christ has done for us on the cross. Jesus said, as we come to this table, as we take this bread and eat it, and as we drink this cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. What do we remember of him at the table? First, we remember that he was betrayed. Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, says, I deliver to you what was first given to me, that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. The whole night began with the betrayal of Jesus. The hardest thing about betrayal is that it can't come from your enemies. You expect the harm that comes from your enemies. You don't expect the hurt that comes from your closest friends. And one of the things that we remember in his suffering is that it began with betrayal from Jesus' own inner circle, one that he had called to be his follower and friend, had sold him out for his own gain, 30 pieces of silver. Judas was willing to betray Jesus, and it wasn't just that act alone as if that wasn't bad enough, but when the deal was sealed in the garden of Gethsemane, the signal do you remember, was a kiss, an insincere act of affection. Jesus was betrayed by those closest to him. We remember this morning as we think of the cross and his suffering and what led to it that Jesus was abandoned. 
Secondly, what was it that was going on in the garden? Do you remember the scene there the night before he was crucified? Jesus in agony in the garden so suddenly. We know that he wasn't being over dramatic, nor were the gospel writers being over dramatic in their description. Mark records that Jesus himself was astonished by the anxiety that he felt there in the garden. Luke records being a physician that so great was the pressure and the stress of that moment that he sweat great drops of blood. What was going on in the garden? Well, we know that even those who hadn't betrayed him would soon abandon him. They would all flee in fear when they came to arrest him. But more than that was the abandonment of his father. See, Jesus lived in perfect, unbroken communion with the father. And in the garden, three times he goes to pray. Three times he turns his face toward the father. And the father turns his face away. Jesus had never experienced that kind of abandonment. It would culminate, of course, you remember, at the cross when Jesus would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The true terror and deepest agony of the cross was not the physical suffering, but the forsaking of his own father, his heavenly father. And that began all the way back in the garden when Jesus fell to pray, to seek the face of his father and his father turned his face away. He was betrayed, he was abandoned, he was accused. As they arrested him and led him to the high priest's house, people came forward with accusations against Jesus. Jesus, the Carpenter from Nazareth who healed the sick and delivered the possessed and raised up the dead. Jesus, the one who showed compassion for those who were hungry, the one who taught those who were in need of direction. Everywhere he went, he was doing good, and yet when he stood on trial, he was accused. How? Because they took words that he actually said and twisted them. He said he was going to destroy the temple. Well, he did say those words, but that's not what he meant. And yet false accusation after false accusation was hurled at him. He stood accused. He was abused. This was no act of justice. It looked like a trial on the surface, but those who were supposed to protect abused their power and their privilege to harm as they mocked him, as they blindfolded him, as they struck him, and they said, prophesy, if you're the son of God, who hit you? As they spit on him, as they abused him and they condemned him. It wasn't just the accusation and the abuse, the betrayal and the abandonment, but they actually handed down a guilty verdict to an innocent man. They condemned him of a crime worthy not only of death, but the worst kind of humiliating excruciating death. And so they handed him over to Pilate in the morning. And his suffering continued as they began to torture him, not because there was any legitimacy to the charges. Pilate knew it, do you remember? He asked them, what has this man done wrong? What is he guilty of? I find no fault with this man having examined him myself, and yet he could feel 
the pressure of the crowd, the pressure of the religious and political leaders of the day and all of the dynamics that went along with that. And so Pilate, thinking that he could appease them and that he could please them, offers Jesus up to be scourged. Now, the Bible is so undramatic of its descriptions of these events. It just simply says in the gospel accounts, and he was scourged. But do you know what that means? It means that he was handed over to men who were professionals at extracting the maximum amount of pain and suffering that a human being could ever endure without actually killing them. The scourging was something that required expertise because most of the victims who endured something like a scourging would die in the very process of it. Most people couldn't survive that. They would take a whip, a flagellum, a cat of nine tails, they called it, on the ends of the nine throngs that came out of the handle, these leather straps were these lead balls. And you would get just the right length away from the person who would suffer this punishment so that the lead balls would first fall on their back, creating these huge welts and bruises that would swell up all over the body. And then you would get closer so that the scraps of bone and metal and shards of glass that were embedded in the straps could begin to tear open those welts and bruises. And so severe was the torture of the scourging that many times the people's internal organs would be exposed. It would completely rip away the flesh entirely from their body. If you go to Israel with us next year, there's a, there's a place that we go in the Antonio Fortress where these kinds of things were carried out, where the soldiers were stationed and where the condemned would suffer. And in the pavement of one of the stones from that time is a game that's etched, carved into the stone. It's called the Basileum, the game of the kings. And the soldiers from Rome would play these games. They would be allowed typically to play it once a year where they would take a condemned Victim, and they would be allowed to do whatever to this poor person that they would want to do to Caesar if they could. You think, well, why would they want to hurt Caesar? Well, think about it. Months and months on end posted in a hot, desertous, brutal, tension-filled post like Jerusalem far from their families, far from their homes. They would learn in some ways to hate the places and the people where they were. And so all of that aggression through this game would be allowed to be released on some poor victim. Here, take this person and play the game, Basileum, the game of the king, and do whatever to them. Get all your frustration and aggression and anger out that you have towards Caesar. And this certainly seems to be the game that they played with Jesus as they put a purple robe around his scourged body, a crown of thorns smashed into his head. And they said, hail Caesar, hail the king of the Jews. Usually the game would end after all the torture and the suffering with one of the soldiers taking out his sword and putting the person out of their misery. But Pilate's orders would have stopped them short. You can play your games, you can scourge him, make him suffer so the people see it and perhaps that will take the pressure off. And so Pilate presents Christ in his suffering, in his agony before the crowd And says, behold the man. Is it enough? And they cried out, crucify him. Away with him. And so they took him 
having tortured him, having mocked him as if his suffering wasn't enough. And they took him to crucify him. Again, the gospel records are so understated. It just simply says they took him to the place of the skull in Latin, Calvary, in Greek, Golgotha, and they crucified him. Don't think of a cross that looks like this. This is what it has become to us, an emblem of beauty. But for them, nothing like this. It was the worst kind of death that a person could experience. Don't think of a cross on a, on a hill with a sunset behind it. Don't think of a picturesque moment. Think of a garbage dump outside the city with the rock formation behind it that would look at a distance like a skull. And think of three victims nailed to not redwood, beautifully sanded crosses, but rough, gnarly olive trees that were at eye level so that the people that were passing by on the main road to get into the city could look into the eyes of the person suffering. It was meant to be a message to anybody that saw it. This is what happens when you mess with Rome. And so they drove the spikes through his hands, through his feet. They nailed him up to the cross. And again, this was a process that was carefully calculated to bring the maximum kind of excruciating pain prolonged over the most amount of time that you could possibly get it. Normally, victims that were crucified would suffer for days and days, ultimately dying of starvation, sometimes dying of a lack of oxygen. Because when they nailed you to the cross, the weight of your body would pull on the nails and fall down with the full weight of your body hanging on those nails through the wrist that would many times dislocate your shoulders and paralyze your chest muscles so you couldn't breathe. Despite being in absolute agony, you would have to push up on the weight of the spike through your foot so that you could get that breath in your lungs and then slump back down to push it out of your lungs. And for hour after hour after day after day, you would push yourself up and down just to get your breath. Sending the shock and the agony of the pain through those points where the spikes were driven through your wrists and your feet. Jesus was crucified. And still, the mocking the games that were being played, not just down at the Antonio Fortress on the pavement, but at the foot of the cross as they cast their lots to divide his garments. It was graphic. It was gruesome. It was awful. And they mocked him, saying, if you're the king, if you're the son of God, Come down from the cross. Show us. And they spit on him, even as he still hung there. See, I think the gospel accounts and the descriptions of Scripture in some ways are understated because the hearers of those days would have had the image firmly in their minds. This is something that they would have seen on a regular basis, living in the Roman Empire they knew what the picture looked like when the gospel writers wrote, and he was crucified. Many of them, the horrific graphic images of their own experience of seeing this scene probably rushed into their heads. And so when Paul comes to a, a place like Galatia, when he comes to a place like Corinth and says, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. 
Think of the image. Think of the impression. Think of the graphic nature of the description of what Paul was saying. And how he would say, this message of the cross is at the very core and the center of what we believe. So much so that the cross is never something that we move on from or progress from. I think sometimes we think that. If we're not careful, we can catch ourselves thinking, yeah, well, the cross is where you start. That's the message that you first hear, but but from there you move on. Paul would say, no, you never move on. This is the place that we come to over and over again for clarity, for strength, for grace, for help. Because in this graphic image, God is displaying his love for us. See, if you ask why the cross, why such suffering? Why so graphic? Why is this at the center of our faith and worship and what we believe? Why is this the place that we come again and again? There's so many things that Jesus accomplished through his suffering. And we could examine all of those things that he accomplished if we ask the question, why did he die? Why the cross? Why did he suffer? He died to accomplish many things. He suffered to accomplish many things for us. But beneath all of it is one powerful, pure motive, the love of God. For God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. He was crucified. He was mocked. He was tortured. He was condemned. He was abused. He was accused. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. And think of it this way. As Jesus hung up on the cross, demonstrating God's love and the full weight of the wrath of God poured out for our sin on him. Look to the cross and see that the full weight of even God's wrath could not dissolve his love. Look at what he suffered. Look at what he went through, not just for us, but because of us. And yet Jesus didn't say in the midst of his suffering, you know what? I'm done. I just can't do this anymore. I just don't love you anymore. My love can't hold up under all that Suffering and under all that weight, if you can see it, it's hard to even understand the way his love held up through all that he endured. So that when it is offered to you and to me today at his table, behold, the emblems of his love. We can receive it with joy and with faith that many waters cannot quench the flame of his love for his love endures forever. In fact, when John later on would write his epistle, 1 John chapter 3, he would say, thinking of these very things, behold, look, look, look where? Look at the cross. Behold 
what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Dear church, once a month, on the first Sunday of each month, we gather at this table to take a little cracker and a little cup of juice that are meant to remind us of something that we should never forget, something that we should come back to over and over and over again, see his suffering, see his sacrifice, and see his love for us as he endured it all for you and for me. And as we come to the table this morning, this is the time that we remember that the church is many things, the pillar and the ground of truth, an outpost for the gospel to be preserved and proclaimed, a place where disciples and followers of Jesus are being made. The church is many things, but there's one thing we can't forget that we are when we come to this table. The church is a family. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we would be called the children of God, the family of God. And what I want to say to you this morning as we come again to consider the cross, to portray it publicly, Christ crucified for all to see, I want us to consider this morning that there are many people here today who need the new family of God. Many of us, in fact, all of us need this new family of God as we come around this table to be a part, to participate as sons and daughters in the family of God. Gathered around this table, remembering, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Did you know that that idea of remembering is not just the idea of taking some past event and recalling it to our minds? But it's to do so in a way where we take the past and we bring the past story and the divine action of the past into the present in such a way that we actually become a part of the story, and receive all of the benefits of participating in it. Why? Because Christ is publicly portrayed as crucified among you. Do you see it? The significance of it. Do you receive it today as you remember what he did for you? That's where we bring this story, this image, this graphic image from the past into the present and we participate in it. We take and we eat of his body and remember how it was broken for us and we drink of this cup and remember that his blood was shed. Church, let's remember him today as we come to his table. Let's remember that we are a family as we gather, and let's behold his love again as we look to the cross. Let's pray.